where he says on Roman numeral 8, or where there would be a Roman numeral 8, that this story soon becomes more intense and perhaps more essentially heroic than the preceding adventures. For here, Taron comes to grips with a merciless opponent, the truth about himself. Notice, it's, it's not about Taron defeating an enemy. It's about Taron defeating himself, really. This is meant to be a serious tale in the way that all humor is serious and all fantasy true. I'll let you try to figure out what all humor is, seri all humor is serious and all fantasy true what that means. So let's start with chapter one. We find out it's springtime. Another year has seemingly gone by. And Call addresses Taryn on the first page and says, Now, my boy, I've seen you restless as a wolf on a tether ever since you came back from the Isle of Mona. Pine for the princess, Ilan, we if you must, but don't upset the milk pail. That is, I know you're in love with her, but don't let it mess up your work. Come, cheer up. I'll teach you the high secrets of planting turnips or raising cabbages or whatever you might want to know. Do you really think Taryn wants to know anything about, about planting turnips or raising cabbages? I would say not. Yeah. What I would know, only Dalbin can tell me. He says, don't bother Dalbin. His thoughts are on deeper matters. Have patience. Bide your time. Taryn, I can bide my time no longer. It is in my heart to speak with him now. He goes, I wouldn't do that. Taryn, you know, ever the headstrong, makes his way to Dalbin's. And... We see Akron. She did not raise her head or speak. It was Ocran, thwarted in her scheme to regain her ancient power from the ruined castle of Lear. The once haughty queen had accepted the refuge Dalbin offered. Though by her own choice, she who had long ago ruled Pradane toiled now at the tasks Ilanwi had done before departing for Mona. And at day's end silently vanished to her pallet of straw in the granary. What were the tasks Ilan we used to do? She was like a scullery maid. Scullery maid. Did the dishes, cleaned up, checked the chickens for eggs and such. So, what have we just been told? She who had once been queen of all Pradane is now by her own choice washing dishes, and gathering eggs. So, Taryn goes in and kind of accosts Dalbin, bottom of page four. And Dalbin says, I never cease to wonder that the young, with all their pride of strength, should find their own concerns such a weighty burden they must be shared with the old. It's just a long, convoluted way of saying, you're bothering me. Whereas the old, never matter. What do you want? Tara. <clears throat> but Dalvin says, but before you ask, I always well, no more unhappy than any pretty young madcap obliged to turn a hand to sewing instead of swordplay. Second, no, call has not returned. Okay. Finally, an assistant pig keeper should have task enough to busy himself outdoors. It's a way of saying, and third, I don't really want to hear what you have to say or what you have to ask. What then brings you here? What do you want? One thing. All that I have, I owe to your kindness. You've given me a home and a name. What's his name? Taryn. Okay. Of Kara Dalbin. I'm not Taryn. Last name. Okay. Like Elardu, Eladir Pinlarku. Pinlarku means son of Larku. Okay. 
and let me live as a son in your household. Yet who am I in truth? Who are my parents? You've taught me much, but kept this always from me. Dalvin, since it has always been thus, that is, since you've always been Terran of Caradalvin, since you've always been treated like a son, since you've always had a home and a name, why does it matter now? In other words, what's the point, Terran? Come on, speak up. If you want truth, you should begin by giving it. What's Dalvin mean? You're not being honest with me, Taryn. What is really lying heavily on your heart? Behind your question, I think I see the shadow of a certain golden-haired princess. What does Taryn really want to know? Uh, who his parents are so he can ask Ailanwi and Eve to marry him. That's exactly right. I want to marry Ailanwi, but I can't if I'm just an assistant pig keeper, right? I got to be noble birth. Terence's face flushes. It is so. When Arlanri returns, it is in my heart to ask her to wed. But this I cannot do. This I will not do. Notice, it's not cannot. It's I choose not. Until I learn who I am. He's not saying, I'm going to ask her to marry me if I'm just a nobody. If my father was a thief, he means, I'm not going to ask her to marry me until I find out I'm not of low birth. An unknown foundling with a borrowed name cannot ask for the hand of a princess. That's why he says, I will not. What is my parentage? I cannot rest until I know. Am I lowly born or nobly? Am I somebody? Do I have a last name that matters? Or am I just a poor slob? <laughs> Dalbin. Uh, I, I think the latter, the, the nobly born, would suit you better. It would be my hope. But no matter if there is honor, yes, let me share of it. What does he mean? Karen thinks honor is found where? In name. Exactly. In your name. Honor equals name. Gwydion is honorable. Why? Because he's the son of man. Because he's the prince. <laughs> That's it. Does Taryn think Call is honorable or has honor? What has he heard about Call? He went into Anubin to get him went out. He was an amazing hero. But he has a name, Call, son of Call Fruer. Taryn is still. What about Dalbin? He doesn't have a last name. Yeah, it's Dalbin. Of Gary Dalbin. But he's 369 years old and he's a wise wizard or whatever you want to call him. Everybody knows Dalbin. You don't need to specify. Even the three weird sisters, ladies, whatever they were. Okay? Taryn says, if there is shame, that is, if. I'm not high born. So, if you're not royal, then what? Then you're shameful. Yeah. Then low, base, shame. Okay? Turns an either or kind of person. It's either this or it's that. It's white or it's black. Nothing in between. I'm not saying that's Good or bad, sir. I'm just saying that's how he is. So, Dalbin says, It takes as much strength of heart to share the one as to face the other. To share the one, Terence says, If I am noble, then I will share it. Okay. If there is shame, I will face it. Dalbin, it takes as much, as much what? Strength in here to do either of those. Dalbin's essentially saying, Terence, this and this, they're not important. What is important? What you do with your life. Yeah, how you face it. How you react to it. What you may ask, well, excuse me, what you ask, I may not answer. Prince Gwydion knows no more than I. 
sensing Terran's thought. Sensing Terran's going to go, well, I'm going to go ask Gwydion if he knows who I am. Nor can the High King Math help you. Kind of surmising, I think, that Terran's thinking, maybe I'm a lost son of the High King. Wouldn't that be cool? That would make me, you know, perfectly equal to I laundry, prince, princess, what they're supposed to do. Taryn, okay, then let me learn for myself. Give me leave to seek my own answer. Dalvin studies him. Once the apple is ripe, no man can turn it back to a greening. What? How's that for a proverb? Once the apple is ripe, you can never make it green again. What the hell is that supposed to mean? When somebody's made up their mind, you can't turn them away. Bingo. Taryn is resolved. He's not going to unresolve him. Is this indeed your wish? I ask nothing more. Go ahead. Journey then wherever you choose. Learn what lies in your power to learn. Taryn says, thanks. Gurgi says, no, not without me. Taryn says, road may be a long one. His implication is, I may not come back. Gurgi, I will come. And we're told, right exact middle of that page, a strange glance of pity crossed the enchanter's face. Gurgi's staunchness and good sense I do not doubt, he says to Terran, though before your search is ended, the comfort of his kindly heart may stand you in better stead. If Gurgi is willing, let him go. In other words, he says to Terran what Albus Dumbledore says to Harry Potter in the sixth book. You need your friends, Harry. He tells Harry, tell Hermione and Ron what I've told you. Okay? Dalvin is saying, you need Gurgi. In other words, you're not going to achieve this quest <laughs> on your own. Taryn bows. So be it, says Dalvin. Your road indeed will not be easy, but set out on it as you choose. Why won't it be easy? Because he doesn't know where to go. Okay, he doesn't know where to go. Why else? He has to face like himself. Bingo. Taryn's merely looking for a name. What is Dalvin saying? It's not going to be easy, kid. What's Taryn really seeking? Identity. Who am I? What always, nearly always, goes along with that question of who am I? Who do I want to be? Okay, I think that's related to that. Or maybe this is related to your question. What's my purpose? Or why am I here? <coughs> What's my goal in life? Notice the way that question is phrased. What's my goal in life? The goal becomes something that I do. Why am I here? That's not something I do. That's like, you know, what's the purpose of this? It's to hold liquid. It's not designed, even if I put the cap on it, so it doesn't spill everything out. It's not designed to be used as a hammer. It'd make a pretty useless hammer, right? Mm -hmm. Similarly, this is designed to ride on these. This is not designed, if I so wished it to be, to work like a gun. Because I could go, bang! Jonathan's still there. <laughs> doesn't do that. Okay. This gets not at, why did my parents have sex? It's, why did the universe see to it that I come into existence? That's tied in with this. Taryn wants to know, what am I good for? What's he been good for so far? Uh, helping out Gwydion. First book. What does he do? He saves Gwydion. He attempts to save Gwydion at least. And Gwydion tapes, takes the attempt as being the act itself. Okay? Though you may not find what you seek, you will surely return a little wiser. 
Why surely? Because if you're going to go out and start asking questions, you got to learn some things. And perhaps even grown to manhood in your own right. Anybody know ancient Greece at Delphi? At Delphi, there's a like a stone. And the stone has a fissure, a crack in it. Okay? And in ancient Greece, there was an oracle that is a person who would sit there and then kind of go into a trance and then they would reveal certain truths. That was the oracle at Delphi. Okay? Supposedly, the god Apollo spoke here to the oracle. Outside the building where this was, there was a stone. And inscribed on the stone were two words. Anybody know what they were? Know thyself. Okay? So you come up to the Oracle of Delphi, you're asking, you want to ask the gods a question. Or you want to ask the God a question about a prophecy. What's my future? And the first thing you see is know yourself. It's a way of kind of saying, don't bother me with trite, stupid questions. Know who you are. Okay. Well, Socrates had been told that the oracle at Delphi said, the wisest man in the world is Socrates. And Socrates was like, get out of here. I don't believe that. So he proceeded. This is in 5th century B.C., 6th century B.C. Athens. He proceeded to walk around the country of Greece, the islands and everything, and asking people questions. Only problem is, the questions he asked angered people because it showed how unwise they were. Because the people he asked questions of were the people who were supposedly wise. He would go into a town. He would say, who's the wisest person in your town? And they'd say, you know, X, Y, or Z. He'd go up to X, Y, Z, start asking questions, and he'd find out X, Y, Z is a complete dolt. <laughs> this guy doesn't know Jack. Right? And that's what Plato's dialogues with Socrates are all about. Socrates walking around, asking questions, and then answering the questions given him. The reason he's the wisest man in the world is because Socrates says, I have no wisdom at all. It's his humility. Okay? Look at what Dalvin says. Though you may not find what you seek, you will surely return a little wiser. I think Dalvin is telling Taryn right there, Taryn, you're not going to find the answer to the question you seek out there. You have to find that question where? Inside. Inside. Okay? So that night, Taryn lays restless. He's thinking... He's thinking about Ilanwi, top of page 8. And it was as though his yearning for Ilanwi, the love he had hidden, he had often hidden or even denied, now swelled like a flood. That it's this love that impels him to go out and find out what? What does he really want to find out? Okay? If he's worthy of marriage. If he's worthy. That's what he wants answered. Am I worthy. Which he thinks, Taryn interprets that as equaling, am I of noble birth? In other words, bloodline is all that depend, determines worth. Okay? He gets up early in the morning. Okay? He tries to notice, leave before anybody else is awake. He doesn't want to have to say goodbye. And what happens? There's call. There's Dalbin. They both get up early. Dalbin had hobbled into the court, into the dooryard. This is page eight. And beside him, call raised a torch for the morning still was dark. Like Dalbin's, the old warrior's face in the wavering light was filled with fond concern. What does fond mean? That he likes him. Yeah, that he likes him. It's affection. It's care. 
but it, there's also concern. Dog calls kind of like, hope he's okay. He's, he's going to learn a lot on this trip. How old is Taryn? This is the fourth book. Yeah, we, we don't know exactly how old he was in the first book, but he was somewhere between, say, 12 and 14. So, 13, 14, 15. 15, 16, somewhere in there, maybe 17. So, he goes off. Gurgi's like, where are we going? Marshes of Morva. Why there? Because he wants to ask the witches what's up. Because the three beautiful slash hag women kind of seem to know a lot. Okay? He tells Gurgi, nothing is hidden from them. All secrets are open. They would know the truth. Could it not be, could it not be that my parents were of noble lineage and for some secret reason left me with Dalbin to foster? What did Dalbin already say? But he doesn't know. I don't know. I don't know, Karen. Like, like maybe they, you know, ran up one night, put the baby on the doorstep, knocked on the door and then, you know, left. Halloween trick. <laughs> trick or treat, here's a baby. Listen to Gurgi. Kindly master is noble. Noble, generous, good. Noble, generous, good. Taryn, I speak of noble blood. That is, you're talking about behaviors. You're talking about characteristics and actions. He says, I'm talking simply about what's my blood type. <laughs> is it N for noble or is it B for base? If Dalvin cannot tell me, then Ordu may. Whether she will, I don't know, but I must try. So what do you have to get in order to get the sisters, the fates, whatever they are, to tell you something? Give up your most precious item. You got to be willing to deal. You know? So Taryn's got to come up with the art of the deal with the fates. How am I going to, what am I going to give? You know, Gurgi's probably sitting over there going, don't give me you know. He says, I won't have you risk your tender head. You shall find a hiding place at the edge of the marshes. Wait for me there. I'm not even going to, you're not going to come with me all the way there. Gurgi, no, no, I'll follow as I promised. Okay, so they head out. And they make a way, and he's still thinking marshes of Morva, and he gets there. Page 12. Ordu's watching him and she's going, look at that, it is him. The dear little fledgling in the whatever that is. <laughs> but you've grown much taller, my duck. How troublesome it must be should you ever want to climb down a rabbit hole. She says, come on, come on. She welcomes them in. And the three enchantresses so far as Taryn can see, had been busy at household tasks. Orgok, her black hood shrouding her features, sat on a rickety stool, trying without great success to tease cockleburrs from a lap full of wool shearings. Orwin, if indeed it was Orwin, was turning a rather lopsided spinning wheel. The milky white beads dangling from her neck seemed in danger of catching in the spokes. Ordu and herself, he guessed, had been at the loom that stood amid piles of ancient rusted weapons in a corner of the cottage. So you have three women all doing something with wool. One is carding it, that is, getting the cockleburrs and such out of it. One is then spinning it into thread. And one is then taking that thread and weaving it into some kind of tapestry or cloth. Taryn says, or we get this description, the work on the frame had gone forward somewhat, that is from the last time he was there, the work on the loom is a little larger, but it was far from done. Knotted, twisted threads straggled in all directions. 
and what looked like some of Orgok's cockleburs were snagged in the warp and weft. That is, it looks like there are problems. Okay, the warp and the weft refer to, you've got threads going like this and threads going like this. And each one, it's like this one goes on top of that one. So remove that. So it goes under, over, under, over, and the same this way. All right? It's the warp and woof of a weaving. Taryn could make out nothing of the pattern. That is, he sees it, and it's like chaos, man. It's like a psychedelic. Somebody on acid and started weaving, and it just makes no sense. Though it seemed to him, as if by some trick of his eyes, Vague shapes, human and animal, moved and shifted through the weaving. So in looking at the weaving, he's seeing this thing. It's like there's images in it that are moving on it. But Orwin comes up to him, and they start to talk a little bit. And... At the bottom of 13, Ordu says to him, you are the boldest of bold goslings. What does she mean? Few in Perdain have been willing to brave the marshes of Morva. And of those few, not one has dared to return. In other words, you are singular, Taryn. You are unique. You are original. You are, as they would say in Latin, sweet. Generis, one of a kind. Now, that should be encouraging to him, right? That should make him think, Ooh, not even Gwydion's done this before. Not even Dolbin's done this before. What else could it mean, though? That he's a fool. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody's as damn stupid as he is. I mean, you get out of their clutches once, you don't go back. You alone have done so. Orwin says, oh, I do. he's a brave hero. Don't talk nonsense. There are heroes and heroes. I don't deny he's acted bravely on occasion. He's fought beside Lord Gwydion and been proud of himself as a chick wearing eagle's feathers. How does she know that? How does she know he's fought Gwydion? Has he told her that before? No. Not in so many words. But that's only one kind of bravery. That is fighting with Gwydion. <laughs> fighting with... Anybody is one kind of bravery. Has the darling Robin ever scratched for his own worms? That is, has Taryn ever had to do what? Anything by himself. Yeah. But it's not just anything. Fend for himself. Where has he lived all his life? At Kier Dalbin. Kier Dalbin. What has he had provided for him? Food, shelter, friends. He never gets up and has to kind of gather the ingredients for his own breakfast. All right? That's bravery of another sort. And between the two, he might find the latter shows the greater courage. Well, what's he going to have to do on this journey? He's not going to be able to um, ask Call to fix him breakfast. So, Taryn says... Your concern is with things as they are and things as they must be. I believe you know my quest from its beginning to its end and that I seek to learn my parentage. That is, you know what's going to happen. <laughs> so can we just cut to the chase and you tell me the answer? Tell me who my parents are or do. Nothing easier. Choose any parents you please. What? Since none of you has ever known each other, what difference can it possibly make? That is, find some parents. Rutlum and Teleria, they can be your parents. Why not? You've never known each other before. Why does it matter? You've never known any parents. Why does it matter who your parents are, she is suggesting. Believe what you like. Believe what you want about your parents, Taryn. Oh, okay, well, I'm going to believe I'm of noble birth then. Okay, that's it. Go back home. You'll be surprised how comforting it is. 
What is she really saying? God just let this go. Okay, that's one way. Every year around Christmas time, you'll go to places, you go to malls and stuff, and you'll see in the windows of stores either a picture of Santa Claus or Christmas tree in either one or two words, either above or below. Believe. Just believe. What's the implication? You don't have to know whether or not Santa is real. Just believe. And what is he for a five-year-old? He's real. Unless the five-year-old has a snotty little friend who says, Santa's not real. It's just your parents delivering presents. Okay? Just believe. And the kid will. Terry. I don't want comfort. That is, I don't want to just believe. I have to know, he is saying. Okay. Harry Potter does the same thing in the seventh book. He has to know whether or not Albus Dumbledore is the person he always thought he was. And people are going, Harry, you knew what he was like? Believe what? Believe your memories. Taryn, I don't want comfort. That is, don't give me fairy tales to believe in. Don't just say, oh, it'll be okay. I want the truth, be it harsh or happy. Oh, for the finding of that, nothing is harder. Okay. In the first Harry Potter book, Harry asked for the truth at the end of the book. Why does Lord Voldemort want to kill me? And Albus Dumbledore says, the truth? It's a beautiful and terrible thing. Can't answer that question. You'll have to wait. All right? He find, finds out that Harry's like another four books. Well, he finds out, Harry finds out a little bit of the truth. In the fifth book, he doesn't find out all of the truth until the seventh book. Okay? So they keep talking. And, and Taryn says, page 16, right in the middle, will you tell me what I asked? If not, I'll go. Orwin, we were only trying to make things easier for you. You don't need to take offense. Of course we shall tell you. You shall know all you seek to know as soon as we settle the price and we make our deal. Since what you ask is of, is of such importance, cost may be high. What's meant by cost? What is the cost of something? It's, it's merely its price. It's what you put value into it. Yeah, exactly. It's the value you give to it. It's what you associate with it. I'm sure you thought of that. Taryn, you already have Adion's brooch, man. I mean, since then, I've found nothing I prized more. So it's kind of like, uh, can I re-give you the brooch? She goes, um... No, that, that, that deal was long ago. You don't need to do the same deal twice. So, what else do you have to give? 17, Orgok says um, to Ordu, last time you would have taken one of the young lamb's summer days. Ooh, tasty morsel it would have been. Ordu says, you're always thinking of your own pleasures. You might at least, at least try to think of what we'd all like. Well, there's that golden-haired girl. Pretty little creature. He surely has lovely memories of her. Isn't it those memories that are really spurring him on? Yep. How delightful it would be to spread those out. Taryn, even you would not be so pitiless. Really? <laughs> or he says, Taryn, hear me then. It is true I own little to treasure, not even my name. Is there nothing you will have of me? This I offer you. Though he had taken this decision at Kier Dalvin and weighed it carefully with the moment upon him, he nearly faltered and longed to turn from it. Whatever thing of value I may find in all my life to come, the greatest treasure that may come into my hands, I pledge it to you now. It shall be yours. Okay? In all my life to come.
What's the greatest treasure that's come into his life so far? Ailangui. She's not included in this deal. Why? He already knows her. Or do. Hmm. And notice, Terran's looking beyond them, and what happens to the loom? The shapes on the loom seemed to writhe before Terran's eyes. And she, he waited for her Ordu to speak. Does your quest mean so much that you will spend what you have not yet gained? Terran, or Orgot cries, or may never gain? In other words, we could really lose on this deal. <laughs> we might give him everything he wants in return for nothing. No more can I offer. You cannot refuse me. Or do. It's a chancy offer at best. Nothing is all that certain. Very often we found the poor sparrow who makes such a pledge never lives long enough to fulfill it. When he does, he's a little stubborn. He won't give what he says. It usually ends with unhappy feelings all around, once we might have accepted. But no. No. But others might be able to answer your question. Terrence says, okay. Who? They mention a bird. Bottom of 19. You might try the mirror of Lunet. Where, what is that? Where is it? Yes. Look into the mirror of Lunet. It would show you something of interest, Ordu says. Tell him it's in the Lagadarn Mountains. Terran pulls out his map, and what does he see? Here he is, way over here. He's gone from here. He's crossed all the way over to here, and now he hears it's in the Lagadarn Mountains. He's got to go over here. On the other side of the country. Yeah, which, in fact, it's not there because it's over here. Okay, so he says, I'll look for the Mirror of Lunet. Chapter 2. Terran is overcome by some writers. He tells them he's fought with Lord Gwydion. Okay. And he's rescued on page 25. By a man. We're told at the top of the page, a broad hand grasped his shoulder. He turned abruptly to see a man in a sleeveless jacket of coarse wool, girt with a plaited rope. And he tells Tarion, two of Gorion's border band will have heads to men, but so will you from the look of you. In other words, I beat off two of Gorion's men. My name is Ad, son of Ad. Come, both of you. My farm is no distance. So Terran goes off to Adam's farm. And what does he see? He sees a ramshackle run-down place. The dwelling into which Adam led the companions was only a hut of wattle and daub. That is, mud. Never before in all his adventures, however, had he shared hospitality with the farmer folk of Prudane, and he glanced around is wondering as a stranger in a new land, now that he could look more closely at Aiden, he sensed honesty and good nature in the man's weathered face. His wife comes in. She's tall, work-hardened, with features as lined as her husband's. Right. And so he stays there for a while. And... Adam tells them what Iran has stolen from them and essentially all the farms of Prudane. He says, page 27, Iran's hand chokes the life from Prudane. His shadow blights the land. Our toil grows heavier all the more because our skills are few. How's he doing crop-wise? They failed the last two years. How much food does he have for this coming winter? None. None. So, they give Terran clothing that belonged to their son, who's now dead. And Aiden says um, that he rode for the battle host against Iran, Terran. But he died with honor. Middle of page 28. Your son is a hero. 
the woman, my son is slain. In other words, she's saying what? That she would rather have him live than die as a hero. A lot of good her dead son does her now, right? Hero doesn't help plow the ground. <laughs> hero doesn't comfort the hole in her heart. The raiders fought because they were starving. We, because we had scarcely more than they, and at the end, all had less than when they began. Now, for us, the labor is too great for one pair of hands, even for two. In other words, we are going to die here. Why? Because our son isn't alive to help us. Aiden says, all my fields say one lies fallow, but in this one have I spent all my toil. And he looks proudly at Taryn and says, when my wife and I could no longer pull the plow ourselves, I broke the earth with my own hands and sowed it grain by grain. What did Adion say to Taryn about honor? That there's more honor in a field well plowed than one seed. Their son died in a field steeped with blood. That field steeped with blood does not produce what? Food. Life. Food. What has Adam done? Said he is, uh, Aiden said he's done. He broke the earth with his own hands and sowed it again grain by grain. He says, in this season, our livelihood, meaning our lives, depends on that field. Right. Next morning, Taryn wakes up. He finds Aiden's already out working in the field. He goes out and helps him. Page 29. The farm could indeed yield richly. And Taryn stood a moment looking toward the fallow ground, barren for lack of hands to labor it. With a sigh, he turns away quickly. His thoughts about his horse that the guy stole. He's thinking, I got to go get my horse. How he might regain the silver maned stallion, Taryn could not foresee, but he had determined to make his way to the stronghold of Lord Gorion. So what does he do? That morning he worked beside Aiden. They eat hardly anything, and Taryn thinks he has no other means to repay them. By midday, however, he dared delay no longer and made ready to take his leave. Aiden says, you've been taught well in the ways of farming. Notice, the lessons Call has been teaching him since he was a child. They have a purpose. If you seek a place of welcome, you can stay here. But Taryn, Taryn goes on. Chapter 3, we get Gorion and Gast. Who are Gorion and Gast? Two of Smoint's liegemen. Okay. They're two kind of war leaders, chieftains, they're beneath Smoit, okay? They each have their own little area, but they're going hammer and tongs at each other. One steals something from one, the other one retaliates, etc. Page 34. Taryn goes in and kind of challenges Gorion for the men who stole his horse, right? The men said they fought against how many people? Six giants. Six giants. Taryn goes, that's me and this furry little thing here. So what do we find out characterizes Gorion and his men? What are they prone to? Delusions of grandeur. Okay, delusions of grandeur is one way of putting it. Lying. Exaggeration. Exaggeration may be a little bit fairer. Okay. They like to tell stories of their exploits. So, Terrence says, 35, no, there were no giants, just my companion and myself. Gorion, more insults. You're insulting me by insulting my men. So what does Terrence realize? How, how does he have to deal with this guy? He has to play to his honor. Yeah, he's kind of like Kim Jong-un, the crazy fat, you know what, in North Korea. You don't call him, you crazy fat, whatever. You know, Trump called him Rocket Man the other day. <laughs> I love that, by the way. <laughs> what do you do to Gorion? 
He stroked that ego. So how does Eric Taran stroke the ego? He says, well, you know, it was dark. And we were in the shadows. And there were trees around us, and the trees cast shadows. And there was another guy, and he showed up. You know, your men probably thought they saw giants. As John Lovitz used to say on Saturday Night Live, yeah, that's the ticket. <laughs> and Gorion buys it. Why? Because he wants to. Because he wants to, and he needs to, to defend his own honor with his men. So, uh, let's see, I'm going to skip a bunch. He goes inside to the castle or the protection, whatever you want to call it. And Fluter is there. Um, this is after, sorry, after he leaves. He goes to guests. Gorion, yeah, goes to guests. He sees uh, Fluter at guests' place. And I'm going to skip a bunch here. Um, we find out, okay, Gorion is taken to exaggeration about the military prowess of himself and his men. What kind of exaggeration is guest? Prone to. He thinks himself generous. Yeah. He, he talks about the generous feast that he prepares for Terran and Fluter. How generous is it? It's barely a snack. Hardly anything there. Okay. Terran says, page 41, generous? I think he'd make a miser seem a prodigal in comparison. So pass the meal with... Gast urging the companions to stuff themselves with, you know, there's nothing to stuff themselves with. He goes on and talks about how rich and wealthy he is. Okay. And he talks about his cow, Cornillo. Terrence sees the cow, you know, how wonderful this cow is. And page 44, Gast says, uh, hold on, let me make sure. Yeah, as Terran and Fluter are getting ready to leave, Gast says, at the stronghold of Gast the Generous, you'll ever find an open-handed welcome. That is, you'll always find everything you need. Generosity flows. Terran, it's a generosity that can starve us to death. Gast thinks himself open-handed, Gorion thinks himself valorous. As far as I can judge, neither has the truth of it. But they seem pleased with themselves. Hmm. Indeed, is a man truly what he sees himself to be? Ah, Terran's starting to learn a little bit. What does Terran see himself to be? A nameless nobody. A nameless nobody. Does he see himself as of noble birth, or does he see himself as base birth? He doesn't know what they are, but he thinks Karen of Karen of Caradalbin, uh, assistant pig keeper. It's on the low end of the scale. He doesn't think he has honor or worth. Okay, Fluter, page forty-four. Only if what he sees is true, that is, a man is truly what he sees himself to be. Only if he sees the truth about himself. If there's too great a difference between his own opinion and the facts, well, then such a man had no more subs to him than Gorion's giants. They'd be mere myths. Now there's a nice little nugget of truth. Terran, don't, uh, uh, excuse me, Fluter, don't judge them too harshly. These cantor of nobles are much alike. Prickly as porcupines one moment, friendly as puppies the next. They all hoard their possessions, yet they can be generous to a fault if the mood strikes them. As for valor, they're no cowards. That is, even Gorion isn't a coward. Death rides in the saddle with them, and they count it nothing. 
And in battle, I've seen them gladly lay down their lives for a comrade. At the same time, in all my wanderings, the further from the deed you get, what? The greater the deed. Yeah, the greater the story of the deed becomes. So it's hardly surprising how many heroes you run into. Well, in the second book, Taryn hears that there have been songs made of his activities. They're singing in the north. Aren't those songs removed from the truth? Yep. Chapter 4, Matter of Cows. What is the matter of cows? Uh, that Gorian and Gess have been stealing from each other. Yeah, they raid each other. Okay? Taryn goes, yes? Is it based off of the one prize cameo? Yeah, Cornello. Because the rest of the herd follows up. Right. Okay? So Taryn goes and he meets Smoit. He asks Smoit, have you heard of the Mirror of Lunet? Nope, no such thing. He says, uh, page 46. The Logodarns rise in the land of the free Kamats, and whether the folk there will be of a mind to help you, Terran, I've heard of those. I've not heard much about them. Fluter says, hamlets and small villages. The free Kamats are a bit far even for my ramblings. The land itself is the pleasantest in Perdain. Fair hills, dales, rich soil. There's iron good for blades, gold and silver for fine ornaments, and law clay shaper is said to dwell among the common folk, as do many other craftsmen. Master weavers, metalsmiths, from time out of mind, their skills have been the common's pride. Smoid, they're a proud folk. They bow to no cantriff lords, but only to the high king. See, Smoit is a cantriff lord. He's a low king, if you want. The reason Fluter's never been there is because they don't kind of Bow to kings. They're called what? They're the free folk of the Kamats. Just leave us alone. All right? Terran, no cantriff lords. Well, who rules them? This is a foreign idea to him. And yet, he lives at Kir Dalbin. Who rules Dalbin? Dalbin does. Dalbin does. Who's going to tell Dalbin what to do? Dalbin. Okay. Why, they rule themselves, answered Smoit, strong and steadfast, they are too. By my beard, I'm sure there's more peace and neighborliness in the free comets than anywhere else in Perdane. That is, we cantriff lords don't get along as well as these folks. Why? Because each little hamlet, each little village, pretty much serves its own needs. They do what they like to do, and the others leave them alone, and they leave the others alone. And so what need have they for kings or lords? When you come to the meat of it, a king's strength lies in the will of those he rules. Now, do you think Smoit really understands what he just said? No. A king's strength, a king's authority does what? What did Thomas Jefferson say in the Declaration of Independence? The governors only rule by what? The consent of the governor. Any government that does not have the consent of those it governs is what? Worthless. Jefferson says. Not that it's worthless. I can never remember. I think it's two ends. It's a tyranny. If it doesn't have the consent of those it rules over, it is authoritarian. Okay. Terran. Huh. Never thought of it thus. He said, you know, that's right. Indeed, true allegiance is only given willingly. Willingly means what? You have to know otherwise. That is, you have to know that you have a choice. You couldn't take this and say, ah, the people of North Korea have willingly given their allegiance to Kim Jong-un. Why? Because they don't know an alternative. Because from the beginning of North Korea, 70 years ago, what have they been told about the 
John family. That they're magical and supreme. And Not magical. They're gods. They're gods. So they worship. And when you have the dear leader, the supreme leader, come into a room and you don't smile or do what is the appropriate you know, action to that individual, and that individual has you taken out and publicly killed for that, which he's done. We've got records, film of it happening. Okay, That reinforces this mentality of, he must be godlike. <laughs> okay? What's Taryn coming to realize here? True allegiance is only given willingly. How should he already know that? Because, um, you know, people love Gwydion. And okay. They, but Gwydion's the prince. But they choose to follow him because, you know, he does good heaven. Possibly. Where has Taryn seen it personally? Gurgi. Gurgi says, I'll follow your master. Yes, even to the three crazy witches. You know, I don't want to, but I will. And Taryn even gives him an ounce. So like, you can yeah. decide at the end of fringes of the marshes. Okay. So, Smoit says, that's enough talk. He says, we'll run, we'll hunt, we'll ride, we'll feast, we'll make merry. Stay here, kid. Don't go off on a fool's... Who wants to know themselves, really? I mean... Let's just eat, drink, and be merry. Have fun. What does Smoit? Well, the men of Gas, the men of Gorion, come in because they're sneaking Smoit to solve a problem. The stealing of the horses. And Taryn asks, bottom of 49, Sire, must we battle with Lord Gas? I mean, if Lord Gorion's men have armed, we may be too few to stand against all of them. Smoit, battle? Nah. They'll do as I command. Why? Top of 50. I'm their king by my beard. There's brawn enough here to make them remember it. In other words, might it's makes right. Terran, and yet you said it. King's true strength lay in the will of those he ruled. Right? Huh? So in other words, don't remind me of what I said, kid. Let's just arm up and get ready. Don't puzzle me with my own words. My body and bones. A king is a king. Taryn. No, I, I only mean, if you lock Gast and Gorion in your dungeon, and you've done this many times before, Taryn doesn't say this, but he may as well. What's the definition of insanity? Uh, or doing, a definition? Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different outcome. Yeah. He's done this repeatedly. And yet, they keep doing it. So Terrence saying, maybe there's a different way. Is there no way to keep peace? He says, yeah, I'll give him peace. The kind Lucy Van Pelt gives to Charlie Brown. One, two, three, four, five. This is peace. Okay. Taryn, hmm? can we make them understand, reason with them? He says, hmm, you've struck on something, my lad. The dungeon's useless against that pair. So, skip a few pages. Taryn says, my lord, in the middle of 52, if Gaston Gorian won't stop because their herds are lost, that is, they won't stop fighting against each other because they've lost their herds, because they've attacked each other and the herds have gone away. Why don't we try to find the cows? If we find the cows, they'll stop fighting. It's more it's like, huh, okay. 53. If we can find the cows, Terrence says again, cows... There's more than cows in this, my lad. Such a brawl can spread like a spark through tinder. In other words, this can break beyond our cantref and start, essentially, a world war. Those thick-skulled scuffins will set the whole of Catafora ablaze. And next thing you know, we'll be at one another's throats. 
The lords of the next cantrip, they'll not stand idle, but strike against us when they see we're fighting each other. Terran, but the three of us can find the cows while you... Okay, and again, Gastagorium, to the dungeon, chapter 5. Skip a bit. Smoit is injured, and Terran says, page 56, we best take him to Terra... Uh, Kierkegaard, excuse me, Fluter says that. Terran shakes his head. Why? Because it was in his mind, too, that finding Cronillo could best bring Gaston Gorion to terms and thus end their battle. But he's thinking about Ordu's saying and stuff, and he's thinking about Aiden's farm, and Terran says Aiden's farm, how, farm hold is closer. We'll bring him there. Gergi shall stay with him. That is, Smoit is seriously injured. Let's take him to Aiden's. He can get some rest and comfort. Gurgi will tend to him. And then we'll go out and look for the cows. Okay. So, Smoit says at the bottom of that page, Get me to eat. I may be half drowned, but I'm not half starved. And then he asks Terran, or says to Terran, Claim any favor, it's yours. Terran, I don't want one. What I want most, nobody can get. Come on, whatever you wish. He says, um, you can't travel far. Give us leave to ride with your warriors. And Gurgi says, listen. Listen. And what does he hear? Mooing. And there's Cornello. And Schmoit says, my pulse, Fluter, she's wiser than either of her masters. She's led all the cattle to safely. Where to? Aiden's farm. Aiden's farm. The very field that Aiden has spent all summer planting with his bare hands and on his knees. Okay. So they drive the herd, sorry, they find the uh, cow in the herd, they drive them to Terrence Field, to Aiden's field. And Aiden says, standing there with a rusted sword in his hand, is this how you repay kindness? At the bottom of 58, Terran's like, what? Do you come with them to spoil our land? Terran, I ride with King Smoyd and his men. We, we seek peace between Gast and Gorion. Does it matter? The warriors are trampling my crops. And Aiden, Terran's like, oh my God, what have I done? He stared in dismay at the field where Aiden had so painfully labored. The harvest on which Aiden had staked his livelihood would never come, and Terran felt the farmer's heartbreak. He's thinking, I've killed them. No, they, they don't have enough to live. Wasn't it Gas and Gorian fighting on their field that ruined it? Because they had Yeah, previously. Them. Yeah. Okay. But, but Terran didn't. Really. Since, well, I mean, that and the cows and everything. And yeah, he says, you led the warriors here. Right. Oh, okay. So, they go back at each other, Gast and Gorian start smarting off, and on 60, Smoit bellows at them to be quiet. He says, I'm going to throw you in the dungeon. And Terran says, even a lifetime in the dungeon will not raise one grain of wheat on a ruined field. In other words, what's throwing them in the dungeon, what good is that going to do for Aiden and his wife? Aid has lost all he hoped to gain. One harvest to keep himself and his wife alive. You offered me a favor? Here it is. I didn't, I didn't take it then. Here it is. Now, what, whatever you want. Set Gaston Gorian free. What? Set them free. To labor beside Aiden and strive to mend what they have destroyed. He says, What? I thought he was a hero. I, that's, that's what kind of work? Low. Base, low. It's commoner's work. How dare he ask Gast the Generous to delve the ground like a mole? Gorion, I'll not have a pig keeper pass judgment on me. Terran, okay, pass judgment on yourselves. This is what remains of Aiden's livelihood. As well take a sword and slay him. 
He's not going to survive the winter without food. Kill him now. Look on this, Lord Gorion, for there is more truth here than in your tales of giants and monsters. In this he treasured, Lord Gast, more than you treasure any of your possessions. And it was more truly his own, for he toiled to make it so. Smoit. Kid's brighter than I thought he was. He's brighter than I am. And his judgment is wiser, kinder too, for my choice would have been the dungeon. So, Terence says, here's the rest of my favor. Not done yet, by the way. Grant most where need is greatest. Do you claim Cornillo for your own? Give her to Aiden. Give up Cornillo. Okay. He kind of sees where it's going. Give up Cornillo. Aiden shall keep her, and Gast and Gorion shall have her next calves. Gorion, what am I heard? Gast and mine. Gorion shall divide the herds, Terran repeats. But Gast will be the first to pick his half. So Gorion gets to say, okay, here's half. And then Gast gets to say which of those halves he chooses. So it's to Gorion's best interest to divide it pretty evenly. Oh, Smote likes that. Smote likes that. He says, "Who?" Aiden says to Terran, who you may truly be, I do not know, but you befriended me far better than I befriended you. Terran, if indeed I did rightly, Gast and Gorion will be waiting for Cornillo's calves. They always have twins. And what does that do for Aiden? It gives him, if nothing else, milk through the winter. And then after she calves again, he now has a cow and two cows. And the following year, a cow and four calves. And if one of those calves turns into a bull, okay. Plus the calves may also have to Exactly, be. plus the calves. So what does Smoit offer Terran? Uh, to be his heir. He says, you know, I'm, I can't hold a candle to you, kid. You're so bright. And I don't have a son. He says, if I did, or if um, because I don't, I would choose you. Do you, yearn, do you yearn for parents? Bottom of 63. No less do I yearn for a son. Stay, lad, and you shall one day be king of Kedith. What does that mean? If he's a king, he's a prince. He can marry Alan. The honor you would give me, Terran says, there is nothing I would value more highly. Yes, I long to accept it. Yet I would hold, rather hold kingship by right of noble birth. Not as a gift. It may be that in truth I am nobly born. If it should prove thus, then gladly would I rule Catafort. Smoid, body and bones, I'd rather see a wise pig keeper on my throne than a blood prince who's a fool. <coughs> Run! Terran, but I need to know the truth about myself. I will not stop short of it. Were I to do so, who I truly am would forever be unknown. He goes, all right, seek it out. Whether or not you find it, come back. I will welcome you. Okay? Next chapter. They come up. One, they meet um, Kaw again. And they find a frog. I'm going to skip a bunch. A whole bunch. Um... Kaw also brings them something from a hidden, something treasure, which they realize is a bone. A and, finger bone. Yeah. Page 75, they meet the frog, and they realize once they give the froggy some water, it's Dolly. Okay, so chapter 7. Dolly tells them about the thing he has hidden, uh, skipping a bunch, 
tells him Ida Leg is very um, pleased with what Taryn and the others have done. Uh, and he tells them about Morda. Page 81. Taryn asks, who is Morda? Don't you understand? Morda, this foul villain of a wizard, he's shrewder than a serpent. Don't you see? He's found a way of bewitching fair folk. No enchanter has ever been able to cast a spell on us. Unheard of. Unthinkable. He can slay us out of hand. Not one of the fair folk can be safe from Morda. He's the worst threat ever to fall upon our realm. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip a bunch again. So Dolly says it was his job to find out more about Morda's powers, and he left. Page 84. Kaw comes back, and he drops into Terran's hands the fragment of polished bone. Terran, what have you done? Fluter, he's gone back and rifled the coffer. I thought us well rid of that enchanted toothpick. In other words, Fluter says, when they first see it, well, this isn't good. <laughs> there, there's got to be some spell or something. We should get rid of this. So what do they do? They put it up in the top of the tree. Cobb goes back and gets it. Um, bottom of 84, top of 85. I dare not, if indeed it is a thing of enchantment, because Fluter says, throw it away. Uh, he hardly wished Ka had left the coffer undisturbed. A strange thought, vague and unformed, stirred in his mind, and he knelt. He asks Dolly, you know what this is? Could Morda have hidden it? Okay. Dolly says, keep it, just in case. They get captured by Morda through the Wall of Thorns. And what do we... Discover about Morda. He has this trinket from Avir. Okay, go back to page 90 and follow it. I was going to say that he was, it, it all kind of relates to the last book. Yeah, it relates to the uh, castle of Lear. In the middle of 90, Terran says, yes, Ka is mine. Morda says, when Terran says what his journey, what his quest is, I seek to find the truth of myself. Morda says, you have hindered yourselves, foolish creatures, without the wits of a fly. To the logger and mountains, you say? In the race of men is much greed and envy, but of truth, little. Your face speaks for you and calls you liar. What do you hope to hide? In other words, what are you really here for, kid? Terrence filled with horror. And he notices that... The wizard wears something around his neck, a silver chain and a crescent moon. Only one other he knew wore such an ornament, Ilanwi, daughter of Angerad. And Terran says, that's the emblem of the House of Lear. And Morda says, yes, yes. Too late. The Princess Angerad is long dead, and all its, that is the emblems, secrets are mine. Terran, Angerad, daughter of Regat? You killed Ilanwi's mother? Well, this is even more reason for him to do something. It was you. Morda. Think you the life or death of one of you feeble creatures should concern me? I have seen enough of the humankind, have judged him for what they are. Lower than beasts, blind and witless, quarrelsome, caught up in their own small care. Who did Terran just leave? Smith. And? His Gorian team. and Gast. Aren't they somewhat lower than beasts, blind and witless, quarrelsome, caught up in their own small cares? They waste men over a damn cow. They are eaten by pride and senseless striving. They lie, cheat, and betray one another. You know, Terran's got to be sitting there going, yep, true. Yes, I was once a man, but he says I've changed. As I would not debase myself to share their lives, neither would I share their deaths. I studied the arts of enchantment. From the ancient lore, I learned the fair folk held certain gems secret in their troves. 
these gems which would enable him to outlive men. As for her who called herself Angerad of Lear, of a winter's night, she begged refuge in my dwelling, claiming her infant daughter had been stolen, that she had journeyed long in search of her daughter had been stolen, right? As if her fate or the fate of a girl child mattered to me. Okay? What is a principle of hospitality? You should help those in need. Him? I took her trinket, and she did not live out the night. Her life was no was worth no more to me than the book of empty pages I found among her possessions. Exactly, Glue's book. Like all your kind, he goes on, his own greed and ambition cheated him. Talking about Glue. Terence says, you're heartless and evil. Heartlessness, evil. These words are toys for creatures such as you. In other words, good and evil don't apply to me, kid. To me, they mean nothing. My powers have borne me beyond them. The book served to make a fool taste his folly, but the jewel, the jewel served me. The woman angry at it told me the gem would lighten burdens and ease harsh tasks. So it did. I spent probing its secrets. He gained mastery of its use. He says, until with the gem's use, I raised a wall of thorns, and all my skill grew. as my skill grew, I found the waters of a hidden spring. He found a way to get into the fair folk realm. Right? So they talk about Dolly. Taryn says, page 95, unloose him from your spell. I warn you, harm none of us. Your plan will fail, Morda. I am Terran of Caragaldon. What the hell does that mean? Uh, assistant pig keeper. Notice what position is Terran in at this point? A prisoner. Yeah, he's a prisoner. What's he saying? Very much like Saddam Hussein said in, what was it, spring of 2005, as the U.S. is marching into Baghdad, you better leave, or I'm really going to get angry now. Not really all that concerned. Yeah, to some extent. In the last book, Gwydion does that. And Gwydion also doesn't have a lot of power at that particular point. Though, there, Gwydion tells us later, he kind of figured, if Ilongwe gets the book and the bobble together it'll click somehow and bring her out of her enchantment. Here, what's Terran going to do? He doesn't have a way to defeat Morda. Terran says, oh yeah, this is my ace in the sleeve. We're under the protection of Dalbin. And Morda goes, ooh. Gray-bearded dotard. His powers cannot shield you now. Even Dalbin will bow before me. Okay. We'll stop there. We'll pick up with chapter 9. That's almost halfway through. So, for Tuesday, we'll do a quiz over all of um, Terran Wanderer.